they all re re rely in various ways on geometry or more specifically geometric ordering. Some rely on geometric forms themselves, others rely on the geometrizing or geometricizing of their normal imagery, and all seek, if not symmetry, a certain classical balance, a, uh, an ordering of elements that points to the 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 kind of mind space and actual physical space that gets us away from what they call noise. Noise they use in the sense of um, not simply disharmony, but interference with focus, the disruption of clear communication and even of self-knowledge. Uh, in communication speak, noise is the opposite of signal. And these artists want in their various ways to achieve a kind of signal or even better to determine a signal and write it to a, a conclusion or actually a situation where clarity overrides confusion. I think we can proceed into the uh, into the individual artist's work. Great, thank you, Peter. That was that was a beautiful introduction and tour of the space. Um, I'd like to unmute Lori now and share with you her work. Lori, you've moved from a more painterly approach and actually a, an approach that seemed to be building on and illustrating chaos to this situation of, well, the antidote to noise, which actually comes from a title given one of your works. Uh, what made you move over to this search for repose? And what made you take up the use of uh, found or selected objects from the re quote real world, no notably elect electric switch plates. Thanks for asking that, Peter. Um, I think that my my painterly work that you referred to, I would say wasn't. I would say it was. Um, it was more in the sense of uh, focusing on the gesture and the life force and the movement, which feels chaotic to some and certainly is more in the romantic vein um, and the expressive vein. And what I, what I found in life and in my art was that I was looking to balance that by developing the other side of me, which is, uh, the more focused, classical, minimal, um, attentive, structured. Uh, and I think that the two really support each other. And I think uh, as, I, as I started to do that, uh, I didn't want to lose that uh, painterly gesture and, um, and that sense of life and vitality in my work. And I certainly hope I haven't. Um, so it's just, it's living with the focused attentiveness of the, the classical approach. It's almost like um, 
someone like um, Eva Hess, who, who talked about wanting to be both a minimalist and an abstract expressionist. She didn't want to be either one. Um, and I also uh, have a, a tendency to not want to be boxed into one extreme or another. So I'm always trying to hold that space in between. Um, the way that uh, the way that I got into the the objects was that um, I was always involved with uh, materiality in my work, and um, and it moved from and and aggregation and and uh, and and the connection between the material world and something beyond that that we could call what you referred to at the beginning of your talk, Peter, is the sacred function of art. That's something that, that um, I'd say we all, the, the artists, whether we talk about it or not, we, we do have a, a sense of that. And, a, and the person that brings us all together in that regard, um, close friend of Astrid's and has been a mentor over the years to the other three of us is Tom Whittle. And he's, he's, uh, he's known for that. Uh, <laughs> he has a, a show up right now. And, if I could quote him from his book that he that he wrote uh, for that exhibit, which is called The Flower Bank World at L.A. Louver. He wrote, um, from the very beginning, art is attempted to dissolve the boundaries of the objective visible world in an effort to reveal the hidden mysterious vitality that animates all things. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I would say um, is, it was part of what brought me to, believe it or not, to the objects. It seems like a paradox, but it's true. Um, so beginning to look at the objects in a different way. Um, it started with uh, just loving some old pipes from our house during remodeling or, or, or um, or windows, beautiful wooden windows that were going to be discarded and, and starting to look at them just in the moment as they were, as beautiful and, and, um, and wanting to do something with them. Uh, and sort of the a la Rauschenberg and, and um, Duchamp and that whole lineage of questioning, you know, where's that gap, what's in that gap between an ordinary object and a piece of art. So I started to enter in that window and I worked with uh, lights and, uh, and all kinds of uh, chords that I used as linear um, elements in my work and I started painting with objects. And when I found the switch plate, it solved a lot of problems for me because it alluded to almost everything that I wanted to allude to in my work, the spaces within the, the plates uh, give, they, they give me a sense of pause uh, where, and they allude to the energy that is behind them and the place within that, uh, that we can go to, to, uh, to make change in how we perceive things and, um, and, and how the world actually becomes the, our, our inner and outer world. So that was the journey. Uh, kind of about covered it, I'd say. Um, and uh, it's interesting that you lit upon switch plates as uh, your, it's almost the only found object that you actually incorporate. I mean, you use these push pins uh, and, um, and a couple of- Screws. Screws, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, screws, holes, and the grid, of course, and di different geometries. But yeah, the objects are limited, as you say. And so are the formats uh, quite deliberately. And it's this limit that you set up not as a kind of a boundary against which to push, but a, against uh, a proposition that 
the forms themselves order themselves into speaking to, mirroring, and ultimately dissolving. Uh, this, it's, it's something as mundane and, and palpable as a switch plate becomes something that's functioning in a transcendental, um, even metaphysical uh, context. This particular painting, as, as I think, uh, shows the uh, the underbelly of your of your, of your thinking. Nothing, nothing or nothing uh, ornate, nothing ornamenting. The the schema, just the forms themselves, defined by color as much as by line, but. This too could be a switch plate, a switch plate panel. Now that we see what you do and how you think about what you do in those terms. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, so Peter, I, I do have one question that's come through about you. Um, I neglected to introduce you properly. Uh, would you be inclined to share a little bit about you and your experiences? <laughs> in, in brevity. Yeah, we have a few hours. Right. No, he deserves it. <laughs> I am, I've been working as a, as a critic and a curator, uh, both in my native New York and here in Los Angeles, for upwards of 50 years. And I've edited several publications, published a number of books, um, worked on various aspects of contemporary art from a position of having been having studied as a modernist. Of course, when I was in school, modernism was contemporary, and at this point, I've become, in effect, as a result, a historian of the contemporary. My emergent history was the moment at which late modernism became postmodernism, and I've been fascinated ever since with that transition and the myriad forms it's taken and the myriad artists it's involved. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Thank you, Peter. I think that was succinct and, and, and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, did you want to share anything else or um, should we move on to Astrid's work? I'm happy to move on unless anyone has any questions. So, I, and there's Astrid right there peeking, peeking from beyond. Nice. I would say that, uh, that, uh, Astrid um, and I have been studio visiting for many, many years, and um, it's really wonderful to be showing with her as well as with Margaret Ann and, and Lisa. Laura, you got a question on chat. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that now, or question that now. So uh, regarding the first piece of switchblades uh, that have the rainbow colors, so I'll find that. There were many white head screws, uh, white head screws, uh, which angles were placed in different patterns. Was that intentional or accidental? That was intentional. Let's see which one you mean. Um, so the placement of the screws is always intentional and sometimes they're straight on and sometimes they're at angles and they do different things. And Lori, how do you adhere the switch plates to the backing? Uh, usually they're adhered with, with the screws. Um, I drill holes and you saw me in that photo drilling. <laughs> um, and, uh, and adhere them that way. If, if there's some reason that they won't be secured entirely by the screws, then I'll use glue. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna fast forward the slides to Astrid's uh, portion um, of the work. Here she is, Peter. Well, it might surprise some people or would have surprised them before they got to see the work that Astrid is participating in, in this context. Uh, she's well known as a kind of an, not even neo-impressionist, but uh, an impressionist for our times. But as she'll be the first to tell you, this is, this is the short part of the story, the easy part. The more complicated part is that she imbues her work with the personal symbolism and with a sense of atmosphere that she regards and I think convinces us is thoroughly of our time, thoroughly contemporary. It's in these works, uh, the most abstract and kind of a priori ordered that she's ever made, where uh, Astrid explores, for one thing, the superposition of disparate compositions, as you see here, uh, landscape or the reflection of landscape superimposed with uh, an abstract pattern of recurring, well, they're too irregular for dots and not irregular enough for anything else, but Maybe they're magnified grains of pollen. Uh, as usual, Astrid's touchstone here are the evident effects of nature, particularly of plants and water. But here she's given herself liberty to explore color for its own sake, composition for its own sake and for the sake of the repose that is implied in the antidote to noise theme and even painterliness for its own sake. These actually have been factors that have been active under the surface of even the most conventional of Astrid's work. Her, in her last ex exhibition at, uh, at Craig Krull a few months ago, she exhibited work, especially drawings from the early 90s in which some of the same approach opening up the possibility of this kind of work now. And it's in this exhibition, we were proud to, uh, proud to note that she displayed this work that provided at once a more analytic and a more improvisatory approach to her normal subject matter and to her normal imagery. And I make a distinction between subject matter and imagery here because this is exactly the lesson that we take away certainly on a practical basis from this body of work by Astrid, that what you see is not necessarily what is painted, certainly not what all, all of what is painted, but that's the whole point. That part of the antidote is hidden, at least part of the antidote to the noise is hidden. And in fact, part of the noise itself is hidden. Uh, there's a question asking at the scale of these pieces. They're all pretty small. Um, what would you say the exact measurements are? 
No, I, I don't have the checklist in front of me. Yeah, I don't have the numbers in front of me at the moment, um, but they look to be about uh, two and a half feet, maybe 24 or 30. Astrid, could, you, could you put it in the chat, please, for Cheyenne, the dimensions? I think she's, I think the, the ones on the back wall reach uh, uh, two, as much as two feet square. The I smaller think ones are larger. Are I think they're three feet square. I'm yeah, saying the other thing, 24, oh, the, the, uh, the ones on the back wall are, are 24 by 24, and oh. the ones on the side wall are units of 16 by 16. Thank you, Astrid. Any questions on Astrid's work for Peter? Great. Great. We'll move on to Marianne, oh, Margaret Ann Smith's beautiful portion of the show. Margaret Ann is the uh, artist in the show whose claim is most directly towards the geom language of geometry. In fact, the language of mathematics. Uh, her most recent work in particular works with geometric and even trigonometric relationships. Uh, her, the slightly earlier work is that much more slightly, I don't want to say expressionistic, but Um, but loosely formed, lo uh, more loosely formed, more impulsively generated. But the issue is not one of impulse against order. The issue is the search for order by various means. Uh, the large sculpture, freestanding sculptures, balance themselves so that the, they don't simply illustrate order with their forms, but they practice it. They put it, as you might say, in motion. Uh, in the, this context, they do seem as eccentric. Mm -hmm. I think. We've got a message for a... <laughs> Oh, it's not a question. Someone's very happy to hear from you, Peter. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, you, I, I think the, these these sculptures of Margaret Anne's are imbued with a kind of a personality through their ex eccentricity, but also a sobriety so true. through their reliance on geometric order. Not symmetry, but again, a, a balance that we finally recognize as classical. This particular piece was the pivotal work. You can see that, first of all, it's, it exists in both a two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, elements one echoing the other, and also that the both elements are painted to bring out the, what we would regard as the eccentricities of the wood grain. Mm -hmm. The, uh, these wall works do something of the same. But the, but in doing, in mapping these works, the way Margaret Ann has. She's revealed a kind of a logic to these uh, natural formations or seemingly natural formations that remind us that even the least orderly seeming objects in nature 
have an order to them, an order that led to their formation, whether organic or mineral, and an order that can now be mapped out with the science of fractals. The emergence of fractals as a means of measuring the world, even the universe, proposes a whole new antidote to noise, a realization that ultimately, if everything is measurable or everything is close to measurable, then the noise for which we are seeking an antidote doesn't really exist. That we should be looking for inherent order rather than looking for, looking to escape inherent disorder. So that, as I would hope with all art, the search for the antidote is proactive. So Peter, if I can interject, I have a couple of questions. Um, these pieces here, uh, this uh, the four, four piece, it's my understanding that these are images of the stone, of the natural material. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when we zoom in, we get to see the lovely detail um, with when she lays out. That she's laid out on the images, so, so that She's turned three-dimensional objects into two, and then reworked the two, the, the, uh, reworked the, uh, the objects in two dimensions. Great. Right. Uh, and, and then these pieces, this one in particular, and this piece, are these also same? Are they images of this work, or are they sculptural pieces? This one is both. Okay. You see the addition of the, uh, uh, I think it's some some sort of plastic or acrylic formation, the, the green shape on the right, and, and, and well, the two green shapes. Uh, so th this one is, it's two-dimensionally pre presented, but it's, uh, but it starts to move into three dimensions the way Laurie's work, work does. Okay. And the the the, uh, the platform of objects on the floor, they're obvious three obviously three dimensional objects that Margaret Ann has painted to bring forth uh, the regularity of the irregularities in them, and the irregularity of the regularities in them. Thank you for clarifying. Are there any additional questions uh, regarding Margaret Ann's work that Peter can? Peter is Cynthia. Can I, can I ask? Ciao. 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 Um, I feel a sort of connection between Lori and Margaret in a sort of strange concrete art, if we can talk about concrete art, and a sort of, above, above all in Margaret, if we can talk about a sort of organic constructivism, which is something that seems to be fighting the two terms, you know, fighting each other because constructivism is much more regular and uh, mathematic and uh, um, uh, much more connected to concrete art and uh, organic is organic, uh, connected to the nature. But I found in Lori a lot of uh, constructivism in uh, the composition 
of the structure um, of the, um, the paintings uh, in uh, um, sections, uh, in sections uh, which are absolutely very much geometric, and uh, also a sort of geometric base in Margaret, in, uh, for, for which I would, would like to use the terminology of organic constructivism. Uh, do you think there is a connection between the two so, and it is right my idea of uh, concrete art uh, talking about constructivism concrete art for both of them also with a sort of differences uh, basically yes uh, in fact uh, they, they connect uh, Lori and Margaret Ann connect in their use of form to define image, whereas Astrid and Lisa are more involved with using image to define form. Uh, organic constructivism is, as well, the organic aspect of constructivism has been evident in the, pra in the constructivist practice since the beginning. I mean, we think of, of our artists like Jean Arp and Georges Van Tongerlo uh that uh the curve came as naturally to everyone but maybe mondrian uh as did the straight line uh so that the the, the straight line is one form of organ of organic uh form and the curve is one form of con constructed element. Organic constructivism is not a redundancy, but it is a, a, a very natural kind of, I think, formal subdivide in the constructivist practice. And you're right to identify Margaret Ann's work in particular and Laurie's work uh, as well in this in these terms thank you can can i ask a question please that's instead of typing it out jack grapes jump on yeah. in i just what we're seeing right now are those objects on a wooden pedestal and i'd like to know if the artist um in the intention is each object on the pedestal a separate piece of art that are being displayed on that beautifully constructed pedestal? Or is the whole thing, the pedestal and the, you know, they look like stones or rocks that are, you know, painted and modified. Is that whole thing one piece of art? In other words, it can't be disassembled uh, in the sense that it's, it's a unit. So I'm just curious, since if I were walking through the gallery, I might not be sure whether each piece is separate and can be displayed in any separate configuration, or is the totality, including the base, which is, has a shape and so forth and a color. You know, I just want to know what the artist's conception was in placing that that way? Is it a unit or is it just a display of various pieces? The artist made it thus to propose that both possibilities exist. Uh, when I visited her in the studio and we determined to exhibit this, it was a way of extending her statement about or her thinking about assembling and structure, but also about the integrity of form. So it's both? So that, yes, it is both. Yes. And Margaret Ann uh, will be typing in an answer shortly as well and her perspective on that. Does the whole of it have a title the way you would with a painting or, or a sculpture? 
I don't have the checklist in front of me. Uh, I can get that. Yeah, thank you, Lori. I have multiple screens open right now. Yeah, what? I'm sorry, you I'm teaching. What? Dale Young Dale is providing us the title Second Shape a uh, Second Shape Edition Two. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, Dale has, Dale has the price list for the whole show, so we can, we can tap her when we have these questions. Thank you, Dale. So, so uh, Margaret Ann has exhibited this work under a single title. Um, but the discrete, the, the discrete identity of each work is not, does not subsume entire, at least entirely, into the whole. I don't think I, if I recall, none of the individual objects has its own title. So I um, am unmuting Margaret Ann in case she wants to chime in, um, but she did just say that she, um, this is considered one piece at this point on the stand. Hello, yes, um, I do consider it one piece at this point, although it was never conceived as one piece. Um, everything that I do is, one thing leads to another and it's a working out. It's, um, it's very seldom something that I know what it's going to end up. And this could change in the future as well. I don't know if that is helpful at all. That's exactly what we needed to hear. That's, that's the answer to the question. The work is an integral work for the purposes of this display. Uh, it could change, and it, and it didn't necessarily start out that way. Um, yeah. Thank you, Pisha. Thank you, Margaret Ann. Thank you. Fantastic. Any additional questions for Margaret Ann's work? Fantastic. I'm going to transition over to Lisa Siegel and unmute you, Lisa. You're unmuted. I did it myself. Hey, everyone. Lisa, as a writer, you're, uh, you're also the one artist in the show who uses an element that might be considered extraneous to visual art, and that is language, certainly. Although language's connection to visual art is strong through typography and lettering, et cetera, which is quite evident in your work. Um, does the, the use of, uh, is, does, is this verbal element part and parcel of your practice as a writer or is it something else? Is it a third stream that you're exploring? It's a third stream. It's a third stream. And uh, what what can what are you saying? What can you say with these words and letters that you can't in your own in your own poetry and prose? With these pieces, I can I can bring things together that wouldn't ordinarily be together. For instance, this piece that we're looking at right now was a very early piece and it is the poem element interspersed with a photograph, an image of a two inch cube I made out of paper. And so I took a three dimensional object, I photographed it. I took something that I wrote on paper and I made them the same size made them the same material, made them paper, and then I married them through geometry, through pattern, through a pattern, but without preconceiving of what my design was going to be. So it provides me a third way of, 
of having things touch that I think touch for all of us all the time, our visual and our language touch all the time. And one thing that writers and artists try to do is, is say things on behalf of ourselves and see things on behalf of ourselves that are seeable and hearable to other people other than us. And I'm not saying that it all is understandable because it becomes almost something that you could understand, but you can't quite, but you could walk away with an understanding of it. Without, without being able to read it. Without being able to read it, but you can read it. It's just not, you can't read it in any of the prescribed languages or codes that it was originally, the pieces were originally constructed in. Exactly. And um, less people regard the uh, busy, vibrating patterns of, or of letters as itself some kind of noise. In fact, it too is an antidote because of the regularity of the, of the well, the, the recognizability and the fundamental qualities of lettering, of letters and lettering, the way you've turned them into patterns and uh, the graphic rhythm and regularity, relative regularity into which you format them. So that what we are seeing ultimately turns into signal rather than noise. And also give way to, and in an assembling way, to your other predominant image, that of the crow. Why the crow? Oh, the crow. <laughs> there is a skylight above my writing space. And during mulberry season, a crow brought a mulberry from the tree across the street and scrambled to stay perched on the dome of the, of the skylight. And um, I could be under it. I, 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 I went and I stood under him her, it, and I could photograph, take photographs of it. And of course, they're, they're not just in my life all the time on the telephone wires and on the trees. They're, if almost anybody will, when they know that I work with crows, will say that they have a crow that watches them or comes to their yard or some crow stories. So crows are life and death and they've been part of literature and part of art. It's a back and forth conversation for centuries. And I got my crow, crow came in. And, and it's a crow, it's Basho's crow. It's Basho's crow. Basho is the haiku poet who Japanese haiku poet who's very responsible for what we understand as modern haiku poetry. So I consider him to be that crow. Crow Bashel. Uh, what characteristics would make uh, that crow Basho's crow as opposed to Edgar Allan Poe's crow? I say so. <laughs> Our artist's authority cannot be uh, second guessed, but, but it's, yeah, it can Edgar be unpacked. Edgar Allan Poe didn't have a pro; he had a raven. A raven, the raven. Uh, I think. I think. I think the the continuity is is pretty tight. So I'm getting a couple of comments in the chat room. Um, some of Lisa's work uh, reminds uh, one of our viewers of an artist, Retina where he uses symbols, uh, black and white imagery to create almost hieroglyphic looks. 
but that's almost the opposite of what uh, Lisa has done here. Lisa's worked with existing typography, uh, typography and lettering to create uh, illegible pa patterns, well, importantly illegible. <laughs> I mean, not not unidentifiable, but uh, but not co not um, linguistically coherent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, and then there's some debate about uh, what is the difference between a raven and a crow. So I think that uh, requires a Google search unless, Lisa, you're very well. <laughs> <laughs> Consider them to be cousins. I like and that. Do a Google search. Yeah, and, and a, yeah. Poet, a poet or writer might answer that question by saying the difference is crow is one syllable and raven is two. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on what you need in terms of the metric. I is it in Japanese? I... Is, is, uh, is it uh, different syllables in one, in one, in one in Japanese as well, as well as in? Interesting question, yeah. Um, I have uh, some facts about crows. Utica, New York is the city of crows. And Edna, um, I don't know if this is fact or opinion, but she believes that um, the crows are the most intelligent birds of all birds. They use tools and they, uh, and they relate. And they, they also recognize people's faces to the point that even if they know you, even if you put a mask on, they'll know who you are. And if you've been unkind to them, they will attack you. And if you've been kind to them, they, they will be good to you. Great. Yeah, I, I'm loving the, the comments in the chat. So you'll have to scroll through that at some point. But this is a lively debate. On <laughs> they touch right, everyone. Like yeah. Okay. Got some birders. <laughs> yeah. Turns out people are not people are not unopinionated about crows. Mm. Uh, I've discovered the reason they've been so important to literature. Oh, exactly, exactly. Interesting that parrots and parakeets haven't been anywhere near as important to literature as crows and ravens have. Yeah. Great. Just a couple more view uh, views of of Lisa's work, and if Lisa, you want to share anything. Elsa. Yeah, these, so these pieces, for instance, um, another thing that is important to me is the shape that I, that I cut out and the shape that's left. I consider them to both have equal importance. And these pieces are constructed out of crow-shaped crow silhouettes. Thank you. Yes, crow-shaped silhouettes that um, I found this particular crow, I'm calling it a crow because I can, a bird in a map of um, Orange County, the way the highways and the freeways intersected with each other. And I lifted that bird shape and made it an element that I worked with. And these are stacked, pieces um, that were left after I cut out the positive. And I built these, um, if you could stand to the side of them, you would see that they, they extend out into space. There are these little towers in the, in the center. And there's a piece at the very end that it, once I had this shape, I, um, this piece, well, once I had that positive shape, I then cut an outline of it. And I, I made another positive and negative interaction. And so this would be, if you will, just a line drawing, but it's not. But it's the shape of a crow. Each one of those things is the shape of my map crow. Is it the same shape repeated? Yep. It's the same thing. Another thing that interests me is multiples. How handmade, the same thing is different. A handmade multiple, it's the same and different. 
they're all the same, but painted differently. And th those are them also right there. Mm -hmm. Same, same shape, same crow. Beautiful. Great, thank you. Great. And as our final image, um, here are our four artists and curator in the space. I believe this was intended to be the opening reception evening, but was canceled due to the state that we're in today. I know we were just starting to practice six feet apart. <laughs> Um, so at this point, I would love to open it up to questions via chat, which I will read, um, or if you'd like to unmute yourself responsibly, ask the question and then mute yourself, please do so. Um, I have one question from Jody Banassi. Does Lisa use a multiplic multiplicity in her writings as well? Uh, such a good question. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. That's a really good question. But it might change. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Great. Catherine, you're unmuted. Which Catherine? You. Yes, I am. I am. I'm just trying to figure this all out. I have a question also for Lisa about crow slash raven. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps this is more anecdotal, but it it seems amusing to me is that where I live, we have a lot of these large birds that hang out um, on our acreage. And I read that the, the, the way you can tell the difference between a crow to a raven is the pattern on their tail feathers. And I thought, Lisa, that that was pretty interesting because your work has this um, emphasis on pattern, both with the, the scripted words and with how everything is played together with the crow. And so that idea of identity, once again, shows up in this concept of pattern. So it's pretty cool. That's very interesting. I yeah. appreciate knowing that. A question from Nancy Gifford. Are Lisa's piece, pieces all hand cut or do you use laser cutting or any other instruments? They're all hand cut. <laughs> They're all hand cut. That's great. Um, Edna shared uh, the tail shape. Um, it's hard to distinguish the fan shape versus the wedge shape. Um, and I think, I think it's a comment, Edna, is that correct? Uh, and then she also shared crow's caw and raven's croak. Go figure. <laughs> and I think that the shape on the tail has, uh, that defines which is which has to do with when they're flying or, or landing and they fan out their tail. One of them, it's a delta shape and the other, it's a more fan shape. But that's my extent of fairly extemporaneous knowledge here. Great. So we have time for one or two more questions if anyone would like to unmute. Well, can, can I make an observation? Please. Uh, not so much about Lisa's uh, colored things cut, but the black and whites where you have letters you know, you can see their letters or words that have been chopped up. Uh, what I find interesting about that, uh, it, it's a kind of a, a reference to what has happened to language uh, in the 20th century, if not the latter part of the 20th century, in terms of both analytic philosophy and in poetry, what we call the language poets. And both the analytical philosophers and the language poets felt that 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 the sentence had no meaning unless you looked at it logically or a sentence could be true linguistically but false in terms of what it's saying like snow is black well snow is white but the sentence is fine and the language poets and some of the linguistic philosophers attempted to actually break language apart 
even to the point where philosophically speaking, they said, if someone doesn't speak Chinese, but they see a lot of the, um, you know, the, what do you call it? The ideograms. If they arrange them a certain way, even though they don't know what it means, are they saying anything? And so the language poets literally tried to write sentences that made no sense, even linguistically. So they're always confronting language. And in our case, it's not just language, it's the 26 letters of the alphabet. Because prior to that, cuneiform and hieroglyphics didn't have a sound, they, they just were ideas. So boiling everything down to 26 or 22 letters, if you're talking about the, you know, Aramaic or Hebrew, it, it, it's really noise of a kind. And by Lisa implying language and letters in the visual, I think you've somehow married the pictorial with language in a pure way. There have been a lot of painters who wrote on the painting, you know, words, a sentence, but you've done something very different. You've actually taken a sentence or a word and cut it all up. So we are looking at both a design and yet we're still faced with something with language that triggers something in our brains that says, what is that saying? What does that mean? So I, I find these black and white things you've done, Lisa, really compelling. Well, Jack, um... Uh, the other day I mentioned to Lisa that I considered her work concrete poetry, which of course uh, influenced the, uh, the, the language poets and the linguistic philosophers you mentioned. Uh, it, you're this, right, it's also this, that. This, this uh, kind of graphic visualization uh, derived from typography uh, that leads to a, a reordering of of sense uh a way of imaging sound or sounding images right uh as well as, see, as, well as seeing language right concrete this, this practice goes back to the italian futurists uh over 100 years ago um this is i mean not to take away from lisa's own achievement which is uh quite distinctive <coughs> Uh, but it's part of a it's part of a history. Exactly, a strong history. So, if I may jump in here, um, due to the interest of time, I have a couple more questions that I will read uh, and one comment. Um, and I'm going to call you out, SP, on this one. Um, comment for Lori. Uh, your work really turns me on. <laughs> Um, and Jody, uh, speaking of your light switches, she's asking if you find it prophetic that you utilize light switches in this time of everything shutting down. If there's a, a cerebral connection for you. It, yeah, um, I do. Yeah, I do. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it relates to so many things. But I, yeah, I can definitely see that I I hadn't thought of it literally in those terms, but I can definitely see that, yes. Uh, and another question about the scale of your works. Uh, you work quite large. Um, could you talk about your, the use of scale and its, uh, and its relation to the mediums that you use? Who is this for? Uh, for you, Lori. Okay. Um, well, I, yes, I've worked in, from very large to very, to the size of a switch plate would be the smallest ones. Um, and some of these um, are what I'd say smaller scale uh, intended to be more intimate and then of course as they get larger you get a different you get the sense of more of a sense of the aggregation and the immensity of it and the sort of what Lisa was talking about that she's interested in the connection that's made when you repeat the forms and um, so uh, I think scale can be really powerful with that, but then smaller scale can be very intimate. So I, I, I do both for the, the different purposes. Yeah, great. 
Well, in the interest of time, because we are over, um, I think we were guessing at how long this would take as this is new for all of us. And um, I must say, this has been a really beautiful exchange of um, ideas and comments and questions. And Peter, thank you so much for taking us on this journey through the exhibition that few people got to see in person. Um, and kudos to the four artists who documented it so beautifully to make sure that this exhibit could live on and on through this shutdown and, and beyond. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Don't so leave yet. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to transition um, to, uh, to the, the video that we prepared for you of the exhibition. Um, first, I do want to mention, if you are interested in a copy of the brochure, please feel free to chat me uh, with your email address in the um, chat room, and I will send that to you via mail or email, as well as the price sheet. I'm happy to send that to you as well and support uh, these artists and these beautiful pieces. Um, I would love to uh, unmute Aziz or have him unmute himself and, and say hi to you. Um, Aziz Yea is an internationally renowned percussionist and musician of, of many, in many, different, uh, um, many different instruments and, and genres. Um, and uh, he has uh, created a piece to go along with the six minute video. We do recommend if you have headphones to go ahead and put those on. It really allows you to absorb yourself into the video. Um, and uh, Aziz, can you say hi to us? Hi, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. And yeah, I'm Aziz. Nice to meet you all. And I've had a wonderful time. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everybody. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. It has me playing a drum called the Daola. And yeah, I'm a drummer, percussionist teacher, and I'm the son of Lori Yea, uh, my dear mother. And it's really a joy to be able to collaborate together. Um, yeah, just ever since the beginning of the show, I started sending me pictures and I just love the art. I really do. And I just wanted to be there and sink into it. And I got to do it in my favorite way, which is with music. So enjoy. And yeah. Thank you so much, Aziz. And um, after this, you're welcome to, to leave at your leisure. But afterwards, Aziz will be playing live as he, I think, just walks, you travel with your drums everywhere you go. So he's happy to play us out live um, while you enjoy this. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.
Yeah, that's not me. Sorry, everyone, we're having some uh, musical issues, but we're trying to have Aziz join the meeting again to play live. Well, we're so sorry that the percussion didn't make it through the whole video. It was really, really beautiful. We'll make sure everybody who registered for the call gets a copy of it. Um, and if Aziz joins us again, he can definitely play us out. Um, Lisa. Um, yes. Lisa, can you close us out tonight? I would love to. I First, I need to, of course, thank my collaborators in this program everybody that worked with us and the artists and i also want to say that that last piece um, in my exhibit is entitled mysteriously onward and as we talked about it's it's individual individual crows that have flocked together and it would be impossible to take it apart and get single crows back out. So I can only just say that it's a metaphor for how we find ourselves right now. <clears throat> we can't take ourselves away from each other. And for everybody to have joined us right now, 
is an example of how mysteriously onward we will go forward. On behalf of everybody, thank you. Our most heartfelt appreciation for your having spent this time with us. Thank you very much for coming. Dale has, Dale has asked uh, me to mention that all the work is viewable and available on the Castelli Art Space page on Artsy. And Aziz is live again. Aziz, would you mind playing us out as everyone logs off? Can I say Glad one? Oh, oh, <laughs> hi, Lori. I just, I just also wanted to thank uh, Cheyenne and Art Chair for hosting us, doing an amazing, amazing job. It was a pleasure to work with you, a real honor. And, um, and to thank all of the attendees, thank you all for joining us. Um, we, we miss you all. We miss being together and um, just being all here at this moment, seeing your faces in these little thumbnails and <laughs> knowing that we're all together sharing this art. I'm so sorry you didn't get to see the film with the music. Um, it will be on YouTube and Vimeo, so we'll let you know when that's happening and, and uh, we hope you'll get to hear it. Um, Peter, thank you. Uh, my, my cohorts, thank you. And um, love you all, thank you. Love you all. So in order to leave the meeting responsibly in the lower right corner of your screen, there's a red button that says end meeting. But okay. stay for as long as you, as you want or can for Aziz. Thank you, Aziz. Thank mm -hmm. you.